I want to welcome everyone to the LSE's online platform. My name is Peter Trublowitz. I am a professor in the International Relations Department and director of um, the US Center at the LSE, which is hosting today's uh, roundtable on race and policing in America. The killing of George Floyd has catapulted issues of racism, police violence, and police community relations to the national stage in the United States. Over the past three weeks, we have witnessed widespread on um, uh, multiracial protests um, across America and in cities um, around the world. In the United States, the outpouring of grief and anger over Floyd's death has already prompted changes in policing in uh, some cities and fueled bipartisan calls for federal action in Congress. First order questions are now being asked by Americans about what policing is for, how public safety funds are distributed, and whether other institutions might better meet the needs of providing public safety at the community level. Questions about police and racism that were off the national agenda are now front and center. Many Americans view the protest and the deliberations taking place in Congress as signs that something has fundamentally changed, that an opportunity for real systematic change in policing and civil rights is at hand. Others are more skeptical, pointing out that America has time and time again found a way to avoid making the institutional and structural changes that are necessary to build public confidence in the police. To reflect on what has transpired these past few weeks and to help us think critically about what will be required to build constructively on this moment, we've brought together a group of distinguished scholars who've written extensively about policing, criminal justice, social protest, and more. Joining me on the panel today in alphabetical order um, are Professor Nicola Lacey, Professor of Law, Gender, and Social Policy at the LSE, and author of State Punishment, Political Principles, and Community Values. Professor Tracy Mirrors, the Walton Hamilton Professor of Law and a founding director of the Justice Collaboratory at Yale University. Professor Tim Newburn, Professor of Criminology and Social Policy at LSE, and the former director of the Mannheim Center for Criminology. And Dr. Coretta Phillips, Associate Professor in the Department of Social Policy at the LSE, and the author of The Multicultural Prison. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have all of you here. And I can assure you that there are a lot of folks who are watching, who are eager to hear what you have to say. Um, we've got uh, over 1,500 people already registered for this on Zoom, and many more will be with us on Facebook. So it's good to have all of you on board today. Um, before we get down to the business at hand, let me say a few words about um, today's format. To get us started, I've asked each of our panelists to take a few minutes to um, basically share some initial thoughts or reflections about um, events that have unfolded over the past few weeks. Uh, we'll then begin taking questions from, from the floor. You can send your questions to us via the Q&A function on Zoom. Please make sure to include your name and affiliation so I can mention that when I put your questions to our our panelists and I'll do my best to work in as many questions as possible over the next hour and a half. Now, normally at this point, I would ask all of you to put your hands together to give our panelists a warm LSE welcome. That of course is not possible today, but I know many of you have been eagerly anticipating this event. So in lieu of applause, what I would encourage you to do is pose questions to the panelists in the Q&A period. And with that, let me turn to our guest from across the pond, as it were, Professor Tracy Miras. Tracy, it's good to have you with us, especially as we, we had to postpone your lecture at the LSC on this very topic, race and policing back in March due to the pandemic. Um, great to have you here. The platform is yours. Please get us started. Thank you, Peter. I'm happy to be here. I was going to say good morning. It's still morning here. And in our pre-meet, um, I was very conscious of the fact that it's practically the end of the day for you all. I'm, I'm just getting started <laughs> right now. Um, 
I think for my framing remarks, I wanna make three points. One point about history, uh, one point about government structure, and then one point about this very important question um, concerning what police are for. Um, I'm sure many of your participants, uh, wa uh, watchers, I was gonna say listeners, as if I was on the radio, um, are aware of the particular history of the United States and the ways in which a lot of these issues are entwined with the fact that we have a population of which I am a descendant of formerly enslaved people who have never actually been able to receive the benefit of reconstruction, uh, which was halted in our country after a short 11 years by racial terror, uh, racial terrorism, white terrorism. You just have to call it what it is. Um, and what that means is that the relationship that many African Americans have with police is one in which an ar a set of armed first responders has been used to socially discipline those folks, to um, uh, impact their access to voting rights, political rights, civil rights, segregation, and so on. And this has been noted again and again and again. So the police response is very tied up in the fact that we have places, geographical spaces in the United States that were bringing it to COVID uniquely vulnerable to the COVID pandemic, uh, number one, because of underinvestment in education, housing, public health, and so on. Um, and then in the midst of that, the response that those communities were getting, even as they were trying to deal with the pandemic was often armed first response as if that was an adequate state response to the issues that they were struggling with in the pandemic. So first history. Second, um, uh, the point about government structure. Um, the United States is a federal system, which means that the national government actually is um, structurally very weak, actually, to address many of the issues around policing. Uh, the idea that we would have a national use of force standard or a national accreditation body or national statistics or national oversight of um, local policing agencies um, is a very complicated question. It's an issue that we're dealing with right now as um, different governmental entities attempt to create such a structure, um, but it's not like um, the situation that you have and where you have a, a national police force. It's not to say that everything is hunky-dory over there. I know it's not, um, but you know, the federal government does cannot even go into a, a particular agency in this country and try to change things through the consent decree process unless there is a finding of sustained practice of violation of constitutional rights. There's no even basic auditing function of whether they are adhering to their basic policies, which means making control and accountability of agencies very difficult if the states themselves are not gonna do it. And then finally, there's this question about what police are for. Um, about three years ago now in 2017, I wrote a, a piece in the Boston Review in which I said, policing as we know it in the United States needs to be abolished before it can be transformed. That was well before these um, calls for defunding the police and so on. And I was getting at two things in that piece. One was um, what people are now calling something like shrinking the footprint. Is Do we actually need armed first responders to come to different communities to do all the things that people are, uh, that police are being asked to do there, like um, police um, push cart violations or um, address um, the barking dogs or um, address the fact that there is a man on a corner in front of a bodega selling loose cigarettes. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, you know I'm referring to Eric Garner's killing. He was selling loose cigarettes on a corner. Why? Does such a person need to be exposed to forcible arrest, right? 
So that's one question. But then there's a second question, and that has to do with the state's police power. So in the United States, the police power is defined as the power that states have to regulate and govern for the health and welfare of its citizens. That's not just about armed first responders. That's about the rules regarding whether people have to be educated to a certain level, it has to do with the rules about vaccinations, it has to do with these fundamental issues um, about public health. So one other way, a more complicated way of understanding what police are for is to just think about what role the state is playing in providing a basic set of public goods to each of the state citizens so that they can participate in the project of community vitality in the places in which they live. And with that, I will um, mute myself. <laughs> Great, thank you, um, Tracy. That's a wonderful set of comments. And I think we'll, you know, we'll end up drilling down more on what police are for. And I was also very struck by the framing about how just disaggregated or decentralized the political system is in the United States and how difficult it is to get programmatic national policy. We're gonna to wanna to return to that. But we're gonna to turn to Nikki uh, Lacey um, right now, Professor Lacey. Thank you so much and thank you, Tracy. And before I speak, I'd just like to acknowledge really that although as a, a criminal justice scholar and indeed a, a, just a human being, these incidents like the, the killing of George Floyd shock me and distress me and anger me. Um, I, I can only imagine the, the pain that they cause to people who are in the groups targeted by that kind of behavior. So I, you know, I, I want to say I speak with, with humility today. Um, and I also should say as the first, as it were, non-US person speaking on this panel, that of course, as Tracy's already mentioned, um, this is far from being only an American problem um, in this country. Uh, nearly a quarter century after the murder of Stephen Lawrence um, and over 20 years after the inquiry following that event had talked about the institutional racism in the police that was part of the problem. Um, David Lammy, now Shadow Minister for Justice, was commissioned by the May government to produce a review which showed that racial disproportions and racial injustices remain rife across the criminal justice system and particularly in policing. And really these facts have been known for a long time. And yet, even in this country, we're familiar with these sort of seemingly endless cycles of some outrageous uh, killing or death in police custody, followed by a great deal of protest, a lot of political noise, and then somehow the cycle just goes round again. Having said that, and again, you've mentioned this, Tracy, that the, the, the uh, particular quality and intensity of this issue in the US has, has a very particular flavor and dimensions. And that's partly because of the history that you've alluded to, and I'm sure which we will come back to. Um, but it is does, I think, have a lot to do with the institutional structures of the American political system and what that implies about the criminal justice system. And if you really already Tracy's already put her finger on what I wanted to talk about, but I'm going to say a little bit more about that, particularly with a sort of international audience in mind, because although I know that it's very widely known and appreciated that the US is a federal system and that it, when it comes to criminal justice, the main powers are with the states, I think it's actually much less well understood, this feature that Tracy was mentioning of the intensely decentralized uh, nature of power and of administration in the US right down to the local level. So really so much of what needs to be done has to be accomplished at the local level of the city or the county or the metropolitan area. And that means that not only is it very, very hard to have a national policy, um, it's actually, it takes an enormous amount of work to build the coalitions that you need to push through change at all those different sites of, of contest and organization. These sites are sites, local sites, not only where 
criminal justice policy is executed and implemented, but actually where policy is made and where officials are chosen and very often elected. And of course, that electoral nature of the decentralized system means that in a context in which law and order, which of course has very often been used as a proxy around racial domination, uh, law and order becomes highly politicized and you get these contests and of course that is unfortunately why we see President Trump um, taking the line that he is taking at the moment. I think that is the gamble that he is, he, he is uh, uh, making. Um, so it's hard on the one hand to have a national policy, but it also means that you have to organize in many, many different fora. Now, that of course does also, and, and, and that's terribly important because I'm sure you know, one of the few things that people in this field utterly agree on is that individual prosecutions and disciplinary actions, while they may be necessary, are not going to solve this underlying structural problem, even if they were more often successful than they are. Um, now, of course, that decentralized system with a lot of local uh, power does present some opportunities and um, Tracy's talked about some of this, those in her work and we can see that happening in this particularly egregious instance that we're in the wake of at the moment of, of, of George Floyd's killing. Um, but uh, it does also mean that there's a lot of room for contestation. And unfortunately, the other thing I would just say in conclusion about the American political system is that it is like many uh, systems in sort of so-called Anglo-Saxon countries, first past the post, competitive, not well adapted to bash out compromises and build coalitions. It, it's, it's very much a winner takes all kind of system. And so, it's going to be an enormous challenge, I think, to build those coalitions, to keep that political will going and to realize the ambition to make real change this time in all these different local fora, as well, of course, as at national level and state level. And I should just say, of course, I don't mean that the federal level doesn't matter. Of course, it matters what's happening in the White House, as we can see as, uh, the current administration has has rode back on using some of the tools that were available to the Obama administration, but um, it, it is a very recalcitrant system in terms of having uh, national reform. Thank you. Nikki, thanks. That's uh, it's great to um, you know just have straight up and front, front and center. The challenges that America's institutional structure really poses for any kind of programmatic change. And it's just, it's a system riddled with veto points, even at the federal level, let alone the problem that occurs as you kind of go down to the state and, and the local level. Nevertheless, there have been moments where in American history where we have had programmatic change. So one of the questions I think I hope that we're able to take up over the course of uh, the next hour and a half is what needs to be there to get that kind of change. Um, and um, but in the meantime, I think what we will do is we'll turn to uh, Tim, you're next. Um, so you're on, welcome, good to have you here. Good to be here, Peter. <clears throat> and thank you very much um, for the introduction, for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, thank you to, to, to Tracy and Nikki. Um, for the, the wonderful introductions, I, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty short, I think. Um, I'm going to start by sort of slightly echoing um, what Nikki had to say, um, but add, you know, it will be perfectly clear to anyone watching um, that I'm a, a, well, as an academic as well, a privileged white, middle-aged, possibly late middle-aged male. So, um, you know, come with about all the privilege that there's, there's possible to be. And so I'm, in some ways, I think my role will be equally to try to, uh, to listen and to learn as much as it will be to, to kind of engage and to talk. Um, I say sort of two or three, just, just very brief things. I've been struck by these events in a variety of ways um, that clearly um, the, 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 the killing of George Floyd um, the aftermath of it, the response to it, um, 
appears to be a signal moment. And, and for many people, they will be hoping it's a signal moment, um, something that, that presages change um, in some important ways. Um, it's raised a variety, a, 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 a spectrum of questions, um, many of which, Peter, you, you outlined at the beginning there, but, but questions from the really broad ones about social justice, and in particular racial justice, on the one hand, all the way through to um, the, the matters in particular that Tracy was picking up as well, about police reform, or indeed the, the future of policing. And one of the things that's sort of interesting in, much of the discussions I think so far over the last few weeks is the ways in which I think quite rightly and understandably there's been a, there's, there's been a sort of uh, a, a sense in which these things um, both speak to each other but but butt up against each other in different ways so that the, in the midst of discussions about um, policing, the future of policing, defunding the policing, whatever it may be, there is rightly, of course, kind of continual reminders not to reduce what's happening to issues of policing. But equally, of course, um, there's been a sort of similar kind of or, or parallel reminder that in, in, in the conversations uh, around justice, it's important not to lose sight also of the of the more particular kind of field that is policing. And so I'll be, I'll be really interested to see how some of that plays out um, today. The, the second thing I just want to briefly pick up and in a much, much narrower, different way from the way Tracy was talking, which is about history, is one of the things that the, these events will have reminded um, clearly many people of is um, the civil disorders of the 1960s, um, and then more particularly the commission of inquiry established by uh, President Johnson under the chairmanship of Otto Kerner, um, the report that was published in 1968 and the aftermath of that, raising again then I think some very important questions which, we, I mean others will be a better place to ask, but which we may want to discuss about, about precisely what has changed. Um, in the half century and slightly more since Kerner reported and reported in many ways on, 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 on exactly the parallel issues that are being discussed today about racial injustice and police and police brutality. Um, but linked with that, I suppose, and, and coming back to, to sort of narrow intellectual scholarly, whatever concerns of mine, also, it raises questions about protest or uprising and riot as well, and what those mean, how we understand them, and what their consequences are. And so I, I think um, th there's also a, a variety of important ways in which um, we need to think about public protest as a vehicle um, and how it's managed and how it's responded to. We're in the midst in this country, in the United States, in a variety, wide variety of nations now of public protests and public protests that bring with them in a time of pandemic, huge risks and dangers. Um, and again, so I'll finish simply by reiterating, I think the, that um, of the moment there's something about public protest, public order challenges that brings with it, I think, some really important questions um, for the future of our social order and for social justice. Thank you, Tim. That's that's great, and I, I think we we definitely want to return to this last point that you've raised about the importance of public protest. And I think kind of the question here is is when public protest truly leads to change, significant change, and when it doesn't, and what are the ingredients there. Um, uh, I would like, before we open it up to uh, everybody, uh, Coretta, um, it would be great to, um, to hear your uh, thoughts about where we are and what's happened these past few weeks. Are you there, Coretta? Um, you can now, sorry. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, I was just saying thank you for the invitation to join the panel and also thank you to my co-panelists for what they've said already. Um, I think, of course, many of us are feeling racism battle fatigue right now, 
Um, but what I want to do in my few minutes at the start here is to ensure that we keep underlining and reminding ourselves of the racial significance of what has happened in what is, after all, just the latest round in police homicidal violence against black and brown citizens who are, of course, people. And to do this, I found Gail Lewis's work particularly helpful because she talks about the skin's social language. She talks about black and brown skin as a conscious, a subconscious and an unconscious racist signifier of inferiority, of dangerousness, of animalism, of savagery and lesser intelligence. And of course, the skin social language is likely to be varied, configured differently in different national contexts, perhaps even within the US, where, which is, after all, a, um, a very diverse and vast country. But certainly if we compare the US with um, a number of other um, advanced industrial economies, look, if we look at France, if we look at Australia, the UK, but also there is a kind of universality and a durability to what the skin represents. And those of us who have black or brown skin, it frames our lives in a really deep and existential way, but also materially and symbolically. So it might be variable in how it affects us in our everyday lives, but it's always there and it's always with us from cradle to grave. And so I think for this reason, many of us then experience acts like the murder of George Floyd by the state as a hate crime, because we know it could have been us. It could have been someone loved in our family. It could be one of our friends. There's always the potential for it to be us. And actually, that's a terrifying prospect. And, and I think it you know, really underscores our endless vulnerability and it might be that it plays out in a kind of Amy Cooper incident where we're reminded not to be uppity, reminded of our lowly hierarchical position in the racialized social order, it might play out in a racial microaggression in the workplace or it might play out in us being murdered by the state and the simple reality is that we don't have the same autonomy and rights and freedoms in our lives as the white majority. So it's not just a brief political moment um, for us to demonstrate and protest and then to go back to life as normal. It has a much more fundamental effect in which we essentially have reinforced our political, economic, physical and emotional vulnerability. So we don't have the luxury of being briefly shocked and that may be the case for many white people we're much more profoundly shaken to our core because of the violence of race hatred. And, you know, we repeatedly learn that we matter less. And I think for me, this was really encapsulated in Chauvin's actions and the words in the horrific video that um, many of us will have seen on the internet. And Chauvin says very coolly in a kind of irritated tone, he says to, George Floyd, what do you want? As if he's a child interrupting a conversation, bothering the adults. He taunts him and says, get up and get in the car, man, as if he can. And of course, this is just a, a painful, humiliating power play. It's about degrading George Floyd in front of his fellow police officers and in front of onlookers, some of whom were also minorities. And Chauvin's in, you know, completely indifferent to George Floyd's humanity and worth and he you know very visibly wields his power and I don't think we can talk about elements and and, and think about reform without recognizing that very fundamental feature of of the interaction and I think in the in the same way the rage we've seen reflected in the protests uh, you know maybe for some of those on the political right they'll think of it as mindless violence, they'll use it as an opportunity to um, argue for a, a, an authoritarian law and, law and order response. But it was also, of course, an in the moment opportunity to express collective anger at the violence of racism. It's when we've reached our limits of being constrained by racism.
And I think there should be no alibi for thinking about the operations of race hatred just because um, one of the reactions to a police hate crime, which of course is a murder, is to engage in property theft and destruction. And of course, if we were thinking with a psychoanalytical lens, as a number of black scholars have, we might also think about this as a way of externalizing the hostile, pernicious and toxic projections of hatred that are regularly shown towards us. So I think the challenge um, for us on the panel as academics and for all of you in the audience um, is to think through the possibilities of how we make it stop. And I'm using here George Floyd's brother's words and the House Judiciary Committee hearing. Um, and he talks about the need to stop the pain. Um, and since we've been here so many times before, um, I'm afraid I am rather pessimistic at the moment. Um, and I look forward to hearing from the audience and from the panelists who perhaps are more optimistic than I am. Thank you. Thank you, Coretta. That's a very helpful um, intervention, um, especially to um, put on the on the table the, and remind everybody just of what actually happened there on Memorial Day in Minneapolis, and also um, um, the to remind people of just the immense kind of obstacles, personal as well as institutional and, and, and political to, um, to engineering any kind of change in the United States and beyond. Um, I think what I'm gonna do now is we've already got a series of questions uh, that have come in. Um, it, many of these questions, just kind of looking at them um, uh, are really devoted to um, specific kinds of reforms that might be taken. Here's a whole other batch that was just sent through right now. Um, I'm gonna put three or four of these questions. Um, I'm gonna read three or four of these questions out and then I'm gonna leave it, you know, we'll uh, go down the panel um, and um, and each of you can choose which one uh, you want to, um, to respond to. Um, um, there's a, a question here from um, actually um, narrowly specified, and it's a short question, but it's a big one. Um, it's from Rod Dubitsky. I'm not sure where Rod's affiliation is, but he would like panelists to address the question of defunding the police movement and, and what exactly that means or what people should be taking away from it. And of course, there's a very big debate in the United States over the meaning of that. And that's that's one question. Um, another question comes from um, Aikina uh, Achalunu. Uh, and uh, she asks, is there a realistic way of envisioning um, an alternative method to holding citizens accountable rather than traditional policing in the current criminal justice system in the United States? Would things such as restorative justice and community accountability actually work in the American context? And so Tracy, I think in a way this brings us back to um, really the third uh, point that you mentioned in your, in your opening and it would be um, it would be good to kind of take that up um, as well. Um, and another question that um, in some ways picks up on the point that um, that Nikki raised and, and uh, I guess also Tracy about the federal uh, system in the United States. Um, Ashraq Subhan is a student at the University of Warwick um, uh, Asked, given the diverse system of policing in the United States between the federal and the state level, not only will it be possible to get significant political reform, but there's a twist on this question. And the question is, what about the difference between conservative and liberal states? Or to put it in, you know, kind of uh, 
uh, standard American terms, red versus blue states. Um, you know, is there um, something where we might see progress in, let's say, blue states, but not in red states, even though you have very large urban cities in many red states that are suffering from exactly these kinds of problems um, that we've been discussing. So I think it's, it's to put it kind of in the context of the regional distribution of party politics in the United States that what is happening at the national level in terms of party politics also infuses what's going on at the local level in the United States. So I don't know, um, you know, uh, Tracy, maybe I'll ask you to take the first stab at this and then we'll just kind of open it up. Okay, there was a lot there. Um, so let me start with defunding and say something about the community organization point. Um, and a tiny bit about the last thing. To my mind, you know, I, I cannot say what all of the folks mean or believe when they are um, collecting together and advancing the idea of, of defunding. But I can tell you what I think it means and what it means to me. And what it means to me it gets back to the question that we were addressing at the front end, which is, is it actually necessary to spend lots and lots of resources on armed first responders to go to race class subjugated communities mm -hmm. who have lots and lots of needs and the and the service, uh, the state support you give is that thing, right? And lots of people have talked about that. Credit just spoke about it. Um, Dr. Phillips, sorry, um, just spoke, spoke about that. My colleague, James Foreman has written an important Pulitzer Prize winning book about the fact that you know, the majority black political coalitions in the Washington DC, when they were trying to deal with drug addiction, crime and the like in the seventies asked for an entire package of things. And what they got was a criminal justice response, right? So defunding means to me, restriction of only giving that armed first response and investing it in other things. But point two, uh, it is important to address the fact that merely taking that money to the extent that you can, right? Because there's pensions and balanced budget amendments and severely constrained state and local financial systems in this country. Um, to the extent that you can, you can't just invest it in the education system and the health system as if those um, portions of our government provision um, are shaped and structured in the way that they should be because they're not. And the part of the reason why we know they're not is how, at least in this country, um, members of race class subjugated communities have experienced and been experiencing the COVID pandemic. Uh, my colleague, Bill Goff puts it that, you know, um, he would prefer the term divest and invest, but rather than defund, but he didn't get a vote. You know, Philip Atiba Goff is, is definitely a lot funnier than I am. Um, uh, but even that, right, invest makes it seem again that the shape of those things are appropriate and I don't think they are, which gets back to my uh, opening comment about how you wanna think about this set of public goods. Last point um, on, um, oh, that was actually first. So I, I think I'm not gonna say anything about the community organizations. Lots of other folks can have, add something to that, um, except to say, if those organizations that can do this work are not funded by the state, mm -hmm. we're in the same situation we're in right now, right? Um, that's the sort of neoliberal problem, right? My, my whole view in this, when I think about defund police is I'm not talking about defunding the state. In fact, quite the opposite. I am all about the state and I can talk more about that um, later. Uh, last point about red and blue states and, and how to think about this. Yes, um, there, uh, that dynamic is true. That goes without saying. However, um, there are some baselines that you can establish uh, with the federal government. The federal government can, for example, articulate um, national standards regarding data collection. The federal government can create a national decertification database so that officers who aren't um, criminally prosecuted as Chauvin is, 
um, for doing things, you know, people get fired, not criminally prosecuted, and amazingly get hired by another department in this country. Crazy. Um, so the, the federal government can do something about that. Um, an idea that I've been promoting lately are, um, is tying federal accreditation to minimal standards and not just substantive standards like use of force, but a set of accountability structures mm -hmm. that agencies are required to have for themselves that states require that they have by, for example, requiring that the agency be funded and the federal government can say to the states, and you're not gonna get any money from us unless you pass laws requiring that all agencies in your state be um, federally accredited. That's the kind of thing you can try to do in the United States, which I think is doable right now in this moment, which is why Dr. Phillips, I am a little bit optimistic right now because I think there's a lot of energy toward that um, uh, right now. Um, so those are my uh, quick answers to that incredibly complex set of questions. Who would like, who else would like to jump in? Um, Nikki, go ahead. Can I um, sort of put together the, the first and the last questions? Um, the three really, really interesting questions. Um, I think one of the things um, that, so, so I, I thoroughly agree with everything Tracy said and her conception of defunding. Um, but if we think about the regional diversity as the implying not only the red blue state distinction, but a lot of regional diversity within states. Mm. You have a problem that you might get, let's say you have federal baseline, you have some success in campaigning for a better settlement at the state level, and let's say in a blue state, and then you don't take some regions of that state with you. And this is a, a, a real issue. And if you then, think back to the, the question of the history of policing in America, that's true some, to some extent in this country as well, but it's particularly true in America that much of the history of de facto policing in America has to do with private militias and with organizations that grew up because they were not satisfied with the safety that was being provided for them. And that is a structural risk in any system, but it is one that has particular precursors in American history. And that's why Building those coalitions at the local level is going to be absolutely crucial, I think, and it's a great challenge. I, I share some of Tracy's optimism, but my optimism to pick up again on that third question is, is somewhat regionally based and that's slightly, mm -hmm. slightly worrying. Um, and I think that on the, the community initiatives, restorative justice and those sorts of things, I think that they have a lot going for them and they have worked in certain contexts in many systems but there's one sort of irony which is that they they take a certain kind of um social uh you know provision and energy and resource to make them work and so again this really comes back to tracy's point about they need funding they can't just be allowed to grow up from the community roots they need infrastructure very good coretta i saw you had you signaled Yes. Um, so I, I'm not sure why I'm Dr. Phillips. I'm very happy to be Coretta. And I know that there is a better way of saying it with an American accent. <laughs> um, but the way I say it is Coretta. But anyway, so um, I guess I'm feeling a bit bad about being very pessimistic. But I think to continue that pessimism, I think, um, I mean, certainly it seems very straightforward, particularly in a, in a society like ours, where the police are not routinely armed, to recognise the value of responding to so many aspects of policing, which are essentially around maintaining order and, and providing an additional kind of social service, that it would be much better if the, the people that were um, immersed in those kinds of situations weren't also um, armed and also, you know, schooled effectively in an occupational culture, which um, may be in and of itself always set up to be hostile towards community members. So that seems to me to be really important. And I think it is really helpful to be reminded of 
many of those kinds of issues um, and to recognize that what the what um, community members call the police for may well involve lots of actions which are of course not related to crime at all and so of course that makes sense I think the only cautionary um, response I would have is that it's, sim it's, it's not the case that those institutions, educational institutions, social services institutions and a variety of other community organisations don't also have their own um, problematic um, response to minority communities. So in a sense, the really tricky part of this is there may well be a range of structural interventions that will be enormously valuable and some of the kind of carrot and stick approach that both Tracy and Nikki mentioned. But at the same time, there is also underlying all of those interventions, aspects of penality that can still be preserved. And therefore, there may still be some of the same kinds of risks about um, which are dependent on a very long standing kind of racializing logic of how society works in America. And, and I think that for me at the moment is the kind of the, the source of my pessimism. OK, Tim, why don't you close out this round for us and then we'll go to I, I, just so everybody's aware we have. 94 questions in the queue. <laughs> We're going to be here all night. <laughs> Let me keep it really brief then, um, because the, I mean, the, the other panelists done a great job of answering those questions, I think. I, I mean, I, I've, I've been really sort of intrigued and in many ways kind of heartened to um, follow the debate about, as it were, the end of police and defunding the police, because it, it, it suggests that there's there's at least an appetite for the moment to countenance radical change, um, and and I, I completely am, you know, com, com, very happy with the way in which, as it were, Tracy outlined defunding the police. There, you know, that kind of a reaction to the extraordinary growth of the police in the United States over the last few decades, the incredible militarization of the police, the kind of Jonathan Simon, as it were. Esque governing through crime manner in which every every type type and shape of social problem now in 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 poor and black and minority communities becomes the thing that the police are there to do, right. and so there's kind of in a sense there's no way of I think approaching this conversation in the U.S. It seems in any other way. I mean, um, it would be destined to 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 fail. I'm going to just add two very small other things, which both, I think, are reasons why, as well as roadblocks to reform and all this. Um, very obvious. And one speaks to the kind of fragmented nature of government. But that's the more particular way in which policing is fragmented and the way in which America is just unlike any other polity that I can think of. The, the, when, you, when you ask how many police forces there are in England and Wales, someone can give you an answer. When you ask how many there are in America, no one can tell you. They can do it probably to, to the nearest thousand, but that's a probable and they may be wrong. You know, 18,000 is what some people seem to think, doesn't really matter now. It's absurd. You know, actually, it's just impossible, I think, personally, you know, as an outsider, to, to imagine successful structural change of a system that has that many separate institutions calling themselves police departments which links with the second thing i think which is and it, it feels i mean it's not that this is not a problem in this country but it's in a completely different manner and scale mm -hmm. is that american policing as so much of american justice is it's highly politicized and not just highly politicized, but 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 it's red and blue as well, and and explicitly red and blue. So you know, if you if one looks, as I have on on the internet just recently, you know, one can very quickly find a picture uh, of the head of the Minneapolis Police Union shaking the hand of the president, wearing a T-shirt saying "Cops for Trump." Now. <laughs> 
it's not that the police don't engage, they do occasionally in this country in overt party political activities, but by and large that kind of thing would be seen as unconscionable, as, as completely other, as inappropriate, as inconsistent with the things that policing is supposed to achieve. So the kind of unionization and politicization on the one hand and the fragmentation on the other seem to me, at least among other things, massive roadblocks to, to successful change to to in whatever form defunding the police looks like that that's great and I, I i would actually like to follow up on the union question um myself maybe i will frame that here but there's a couple of other there are many they're just coming through we've got a lot of great questions one question that um comes from sophie um Reichman, second year LSE student. She asked, to what extent do you believe that police violence and inequality can be tackled without dismantling or curbing gun ownership and the Second Amendment? Um, I mean, I think that the, the larger, I mean, the, the question here is you're you're dealing with a gun culture. And, um, and this is why this issue, one of the reasons in addition to racism that this issue becomes so loaded in the United States. So it'd be good to hear um, your thoughts on that. We have an also a very interesting question um, from Reverend William Young, who's the pastor of the uh, Covenant Baptist United Church of Christ in Washington, DC. So he asks, the last time systemic change transformed American life was the civil rights movement. The black church was a significant part of that in more than a sentimental way. Has the voice of the black church in 2020 um, any worth to this particular season of change and for this particular millennial generation, I mean, is it a is it a force at all in this context? And I think that's an an interesting question. And especially, Tim, if we go back to the parallels or the the differences that you were drawing to the 1960s, it's it's worth thinking about this this question. And I suppose I would just ask also to just follow up um, on the. On the union question, um, on police unions, I mean, one of the things that has struck me about the protest or the response of the police to the protest is how varied it has been across the United States. I mean, so we've seen video footage in the US of of police cars ramming protesters, pelting them with rubber bullets to in Washington DC, the using helicopters to disperse crowds with basically, it's a military style, low flying kind of wind blowing tactics to scare the living hell out of people. At the same time, we've seen photos of police taking a knee and in some cities like Tracy, like your own New Haven, where police departments quickly condemn what happened in Minneapolis and put distance between themselves. Like they didn't wait a couple of days. It was virtually, uh, you know, it was quick. And, and, um, and so I think one question that it raises is kind of, you know, it raises a question about what's the variation across the pol these police departments. But I think in many of the discussions that when I'm reading stuff online, the role of the unions, that is the police unions, is not getting the kind of attention that it warrants. I mean, we know in the case of Minneapolis that the police union has opposed reform of all kinds and for a long period of time. But I think what's unclear is how constant that is or whether there's a great, great deal of variation in that. I mean, are, are the police unions consistently a source of obstruction in this process? Um, and is that something that needs to be addressed or is the story much more complicated and uneven? So at any rate, another set of questions here and maybe uh, Tim, I'll ask you to go first this time. 
Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Peter. I, I I may be brief because because we you know we're now beginning to touch on a whole bunch of things about which I I I'm terribly inexpert, I'm afraid. Um, if I take two of the things, so take the 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 point that you were raising kind of latterly about, <clears throat> um, and on the one hand, what we see as you know very varied responses to protest. Uh, by different police chiefs, different police departments, uh, and so forth. Um, you know, very, very repressive on the one hand, actually quite facilitative and supportive on the other. Um, as as one of the questions, and and linked with the union thing. I mean, it's it's you know, the, my my sense on the one hand is the the kind of variation in response that one's been seeing is typical. And the, the, you know, that by and large, I mean, if you, the broad sweep of change in American policing in the last 50 years since Kerner in relation to public order policing, I think, crudely put, has been quite positive. Yeah, that is, the, the, if one went back to the 1960s, the, the, the standard policing reaction to protest was repressive and highly repressive. And post Kerner, now with I caveat it with, you know, huge exceptions and, you know, not that infrequent, um, but began to embrace a more facilitative, communicative form of protest policing. But as we can think of, as it's from from you know um, Rodney King through to Ferguson, there mm -hmm. are huge number of kind of egregious exceptions to that. Um, so it, it's a it's a kind of complex patchwork, I think. But but the, what we've seen in more recent times, I think, is a move away. The kind of increasing militarization of public order policing is now beginning to change it. And if I if I just shift things quickly across the Atlantic to the UK, mm -hmm. we've seen this kind of mix of response here too. You know, the response if one looks at the official statements by the chiefs of UK police forces, it, it's impressive. I think you know their reaction to the murder of George Floyd was pretty immediate, um, uh, and was, uh, yeah, if not a model, then a very positive example of um, saying I think a, a number of important things about the nature of policing and, and what it should and shouldn't be. At the same time, we've had many examples of really poor public order policing just in the last fortnight of actually really, of, of not the worst, but actually quite regressive and repressive policing tactics. And the things lie alongside each other. So I don't think there's any kind of easy or consistent picture here. The unions, my sense in the US, is the ones that have embraced um, progressive change are the exceptions that prove the rule. The, the, I, and, but I stand to be corrected. My sense of police unions by and large is that they've been the br a break on change. Uh, I'll say one final thing. I don't know at all the answer to the question about the role of the church. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd add to that kind of diagnosis from, from my outsider's position of, of what happened in the 1960s and the civil rights movement is the other important vehicle was, was, um, was black nationalism. Um, and both both non-violent and violent social protest, which was very significant, I think, at that time, and brings us back to what's happening. Tracy, do you want to jump in? And yeah. it would be great also to if, if maybe speak to this issue about the Black church, too, as part of it. I, I've got it. Three yeah. points. This is like what I do every time, three points. One about the Second Amendment, one about the Black church, one about unions. Uh, first, on the Second Amendment, um, the existence of the Second Amendment and the wide prevalence of gun, gun ownership in this country has been promoted by police unions and others as a reason why reform is really difficult. What do you mean you don't want to have an armed first responder show up? Somebody might have a gun, right? Um, and, you know, to that, I would say the question was about is how and whether reform is possible in the context of that landscape. The answer is absolutely. First, this idea that you don't actually need an armed first responder. I'm not saying anything about the fact that 
members uh, of a child welfare agency who come to a person's house are doing the best job or are welcomed by the people who live in those homes that they're visiting, but nobody ever talks about the child welfare uh, representative showing up with a gun to the same house that a police officer will say, what if they had a gun, right? I mean, so this whole conversation about reducing the footprint of armed first responders is already uh, a, a landscape in which we have lots of state actors visiting people in the same context who don't even get to make that argument. So why do police get to make that argument? They get to make that argument because they're trained to use a wrench, a screwdriver, and a hammer. Not their fault. All these things around the use of force when, right, one answer is actually we shouldn't be sending you. How about? And you know, we don't have that. Second, even in the context of people being armed, you can do lots of other things. Again, the UK is a perfect example of that. Um, and even in this country, uh, we see that. That does, last point on Second Amendment, that doesn't mean that we ought not continue to do work to make guns less available um, in this country. That's a whole other set of things that I do when I'm not talking um, about this. Um, and it does point up the, to the fact that a particular problem that we have to address in the context of this conversation is that the places where armed first responders often are sent are places that are marked by violence. And so whatever state response we come up with has to deal with that reality. That's first point. Second point on the role of the black church. Um, I am a member of a research co collaborative called the African American Research Collaborative um, that does a lot of polling of um, just African American people in the United States. And the reason for this, drawing on work, work by uh, Black political scientists like Kathy Cohen, Michael Dawson, showing that when you have nationally representative polls, you actually don't get the variation of Black political opinion on a bunch of different issues. So they urge having um, you know, research of a particular group. Uh, this organization does those polls. And if you go to their website, you can see answers to really that specific question. What age group of people finds leadership and trust in certain organizations, be they political leaders, be they uh, church leaders, be they scientific leaders. We actually just re re, um, released a, a, a poll answering that question. And probably not surprisingly, the younger generation in the United States does not look to um, leadership from the black church as much as um, people like in my generation or my mother's generation. Um, and so for a bunch of reasons that if you you know, look through the data, you can see exactly why. Some of that has to do with the, the difference in how the groups understand political activity. Is political activity just voting? Is it protesting, demonstrating? Is it actually the ways in which they negotiate their interactions with the state, which one could easily see as protest activity itself? And that has a long historical lineage going back to, for example, thinking about how enslaved people protested the conditions of their enslavement by doing all sorts of things. It wasn't just about outright rebellions, right? Second point. Third point on unions. I think the, the quickest and easiest thing to note there is to, you know, I'll follow uh, Tim to say, yes, unions are a serious block, but the thing you have to understand about the US, in addition to our 18,000 um, different agencies is there's also lots of state variation on the existence of unions. We have a thing called right to work here. Um, and if you, it's a right to work state, then that means that the police unions are much weaker than the unions that you see on the East Coast, like in Baltimore or New York. So if you go to um, the Southwest, um, Texas, lots of places in the South, um, you don't see the kind of, you know, strong armed union response like you see in, in Minneapolis. That said, if you also look at those particular places, you wouldn't say, wow, that's a lot of enlightened 
um, you know, <laughs> police policy and activity. And of course, that's because there are many other dynamics to the determinants of penal policy as Nicola Lacey and David Saskis have argued in um, a piece in the annual review of criminology, which since I'm editor, uh, co-editor of, of that journal with Rob Sampson, I feel I ought to give that piece a plug right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, Coretta, do you want to jump in? So I, I, I can't respond directly to those questions, but it did make me think about what the role of um, black professional associations and unions are within criminal justice services. So, um, you know, that, there's a whole set of issues around the positionality of those kinds of organisations, but I wonder whether um, they might provide some form of bridge of, of recognising some of the perspectives of, of, particularly of operational peace officers, while also understanding, um, you know, about the racialization of policing in the US. Um, and so, you know, they're not specifically re necessarily religiously oriented, but they are people who sit within the police, but also within black communities. Very good, and uh, Nikki? I won't go over all the questions because they've been very ably answered, but I just wanted to pick up on one point about, that comes out of the point about unions, um, which I think helps us to perhaps disaggregate the issues around defunding a little bit further, which is that, um, we talked mainly when we talked about defunding about the you know the way in which policing has just become like the go-to mechanism has become inflated is used in completely disproportionate ways even over and above the very specific issues of abuse of power racism and so on um, but of course there's another issue that that you know i must say has been coming into my mind as i've been reading specifically about minneapolis and that is that sometimes a particular organizational set of organizational structures in a particular locality simply becomes so imbued by whether it's racism or corruption or you know we, we it happens sometimes with prisons with schools and sometimes they just have to be closed down and restarted because you can't that's a very hard thing to do but I think that that's a sort of another aspect of the of the argument here which is different from the more in a way the more radical and structural and universal argument about what are the police for and how big should the police department be great thank you we've we're um we've got uh I think Zoom is maxed out on questions. Like, you know, it stops at 99 and it just puts a plus sign. We're way over 100 at this point. And I should tell you, we have people watching us from India, Zambia, UK and US, Australia, Colombia, Netherlands, Germany, Mexico. I mean, you, you know, uh, we're drawing people from around the world, which is terrific. Um, We've got an interesting, another interesting set of questions that have come through. Um, there's two actually that deal with um, the question of um, the law and the courts here. Um, so one question comes from um, Mithili uh, Mishra, who is an LSE law student uh, in India. And surprise, surprise, this is for Nicola Lacey. <laughs> so, um, if the policy response fails due to decentralization, what are your thoughts on using litigation instead? Um, and what are the advantages and or limits of this strategy um, of approaching the courts? And this is really a wide open question for you know anybody on the panel. Um, there's also a question here from. Um, um, Joseph Lee, uh, who's at King's College. Um, uh, this is an interesting question because it, it kind of flips the, prob the, the issue of decentralization on its head. So he asks, do you believe that greater centralization of administration 
could allow um, um, for better um, accountability of police forces and therefore um, allow for further tragic events. And I, I guess the question is, you know, one way to maybe kind of um, sharpen this question too is there can be downsides to nationalization and federalization. And so it, it might be worth just talking a little bit about that and the kinds of trade-offs that, that are um, involved. And I suppose I want to just follow up on, on the kind of, I don't know, call this like, you know, the optimism versus pessimism. I don't know why I went left and right on that, but at any rate, you know, I, I was struck by um, an interview that um, um, Tanuhasi Coates um, did this week in Vox. He was, he was asked a question by um, Ezra Klein. Um, what do you see right now as you look out at the, at the country? And, and Coates replied, I, I can't believe I'm gonna say this but I see hope, I see progress right now at this moment. And what he was referring to, as you kind of drill down in the, in the interview, was how multiracial, multi-ethnic, and also importantly, multi-generational the protests were. And he talked about how, you know, he referenced his father who was involved in the 1960s and just how different it was then. And I guess I would just like to hear your thoughts about that view of the protests themselves and whether, you know, that, that particular combination provides a, a level of, I don't know, energy and momentum that can perhaps, maybe not overcome all the obstacles, but it, it changes the, the dynamic. Uh, possibly. So I'll just throw that out there as well. So we've got a question here about decentralization versus centralization. We have a question about litigation as an alternative kind of path. Um, and maybe just a question about, um, I don't know, glass half full, half empty, but really specifically what the difference in the nature of the composition of these protests might mean. And I guess on this, um, Nikki, maybe since one of these questions was directed right at you, we'll start with you. Why don't I take the litigation one and I'll leave the other one because we, I can see we're, we're quite short of time. So yeah. uh, it's a very good question. And in, in many ways, for, for lawyers like you and me, uh, America was, was often, I remember when I was studying law, America was held up as the sort of model of, you know, to be envied for the way in which civil rights litigation had been used so effectively in, in the 60s and have been used more generally to try and combat segregation and so on and so forth. I think the sort of more, you know, longer term view is that there's a, there's a, there is, although litigation can be powerful and powerful not just in getting results on a particular issue at a particular time, but symbolically in a communicative way as a way of, you know, movement building and so on. So it's not just about the individual case. Nonetheless, what litigation is not really very well adapted to is strategy, is a planned strategy that you can really build through because the cases that present themselves, even where you have agencies or pressure groups that have quite high powers to get a foot in the courtroom standing, um, then it, you know there's the, it, you're sort of dependent on the cases that come up. So I think litigation can be useful, but I don't think it's an, a substitute for uh, longer term policy making. Okay. Um, Coretta, maybe we'll just go right down the line here. You're at least on my line. Right? Um, so perhaps if I respond to the glass half empty and glass half full point, um, I mean, I have to be honest, um, I'm probably being uh, perhaps overly pessimistic right now in that I did find it really heartening to see police officers, I think it was in, it may have been in Florida, Miami, perhaps who were taking the knee and that felt significant and important. Um, and I do think that given in some parts of the US in certain, and obviously there's variation by state and 
and local areas, but there are a very large number of minority police officers working across the US. And um, they won't have joined the police service to focus on, um, on necessarily using their power to demean and degrade in perhaps the way Chauvin and others did. So there are possibilities for change. Um, and of course, African-Americans are also significantly represented politically. And so, you know, there, there are possibilities um, for change from within. Um, but I guess the, the, the main reason for my pessimism is that we've been here many times before. Um, and there are a whole series of measures that we might think of as um, some are more managerialist, some are more structural. Um, but I think what we almost always struggle with is trying to tackle some of the more complex and um, difficult, the kind of knotty issues that are, are around social justice and inequality more generally. And of course, they're not necessarily the kinds of things that the police can do anything about. Um, but I guess, it, you know, we, we end up talking about either a criminal justice response and a law enforcement approach or um, an approach that draws from other social, you know, other state institutions, schools, um, social services, etc. And we need to, and I, I think that's why it seems significant to me to think about the role of racism is because that's much more widespread, widespread across a number of institutions. And so that seems to me to be very much part of understanding the dynamics of what happens in any kind of local area or in any given policing encounter. Very good. Um, Tim? Well, just very quickly, perhaps on, on, on one of them, and that was the sort of um, the centralization question, just then. So, sort of a word about that. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, you, I think you said it, um, Peter, in your, as you were asking the question, which is that, I mean, it's a, sort of centralization is a vehicle, not, a, not, not an answer to, to a problem. It's a means by which you might think about tackling things. That said, I mean, I, I would as it were going to go back to the point I was making earlier, which is you know, sort of 18,000 separate departments just feels like an unsustainable thing. So greater standardization in principle is a, is a kind of must, I think. You know, it's a no brainer for the future of American policing. What that actually means, I mean, what the magic number is, well, who, who knows, it's just less. Um, but I think that, that how, to, how then the questions arise, which are on the one hand, how to bring that standardization about and how to improve the ways in which those departments uh, behave and the officers within those departments behave and, um, you know, whether it's the kind of federal accreditation that, that Tracy was talking about earlier, whether it's, you know, other forms of, of oversight. But the big question really um, is, is fundamentally not about structure, um, it's about accountability. And the absence of governance and accountability structures, which I mean, is just frankly ineffective at the moment. Thank you, um, Tracy. Why don't you um, round out this round for us? Yeah, I don't really want to say anything because we have a lot of other questions, except to say that the president's task force in 21st century policing. One of our recommendations was that um, agencies under 50 people it was a quite. It was a relatively arbitrary number and I actually wanted a hundred. I probably shouldn't have said that publicly. <laughs> you know, ought to be um, encouraged to consolidate. So, yeah. okay. you know, what Tim said, I, I think we should go on to more we questions. Should. Well, you know, we're at, we're at 520 and we were gonna, I was gonna give you space for closing comments, but there's so many questions here. I could put a couple questions to you quickly and then let each of you work with them. One I think is actually a very good question for academics. It, it comes from, um, uh, because it, it's an opportunity for the academy to reflect on itself in this. Um, it comes from Juliet Hirsch, who is um, an LSE alum of um, 
Um, do I have the right question? No, I'm sorry. Juliet, I'll come to you in a second. It's from Alyssa Orsler, an LSE MSC um, criminal justice um, uh, policy and alum. Two of the officers in the George Floyd um, murder received their BA in sociology from the University of Minnesota with an emphasis in law, crime, and deviance. A track that seems comparable, um, she points out, to criminology in the UK. How does or should the current movement for racial justice translate to the academy? Um, and um, I suppose, and then I will just go to Juliet Hirsch's question, uh, who is an alum from MSC, uh, got her MSc in Media and Communication. She's based in France. To all speakers, why do you think the murder of George Floyd has resonated so much um, with communities across the globe as we're seeing protests in many countries? Um, what gives this particular, this murder, this event, so much echo compared to, to others. Um, so two questions. Um, I think we, the way we had this set up, uh, uh, Coretta, on the, on the closing is we were gonna start with, with you and, and go in reverse order and Tracy will close it out at the end. Okay, um, so I'm gonna we have, respond We have to six the... minutes to work with. Okay, I'm gonna respond to Alyssa's question. Hi Alyssa, thank you. Great question. Um, so in the, in, the, in the theme of, in the sense of what I've been talking about before, I wonder what those officers learned about the historical and contemporary experiences of racism and, and the problematic history of policing. I mean, the academy itself is going through its own somewhat introspective um, analysis of its own failings with regard to race. Um, and I'll, I think I'll leave it there actually. Okay. Okay. Um, Tim. Okay. And uh, two, two very quick things then. Um, firstly, in response to Alyssa's question, lovely to hear from you, Alyssa and of our uh, ex students and soon to be joining the University of Minnesota, I think. Hence uh -huh. the question. Um, look, I, I, I know the Department of Sociology there is and, and has, you know, has published on this, written an open letter on this, is examining as its practices and thinking very carefully about um, the future of its curriculum and what it's training and what it does. And I mean, I'd know more to add than, than to what Coretta said, which is, uh, you know, we, we, we need to think long and hard about what we do. Um, as an institution, and, and that is not going to be easy or quick. Um, on the just the one fight, one thing, just one reflection on the on Juliet's question, on why this has resonated, and this is not an answer to it. It's just a, an element, and that's the pandemic. The pandemic's a really, really important framing issue for um, the protests. For, uh, for the way in which George Floyd's death has been responded to, to our understandings of policing, of social inequality and racial inequality and injustice and so forth. And I think you know, it's precisely um, the impact, the unequal impact, in it, both of the, of the pandemic and of the way in which the, the pandemic order has been enforced unequally. Has, as it were, provided, I think, a really important backdrop to all this. Global. Very good. Nikki, we'll go to you. I, I mean, I just, I thoroughly agree with that, Tim. It's a really important point to make, and I think it's been key in, in the resonance and also the breadth of the coalition that has been put together at the moment. So let's, you know, we have to hope that that will last. And finally, um, Alyssa, how, how nice to hear you, albeit via this very mediated form. And thanks for that very good question. I really just want to add a footnote to what Coretta has said. I mean, clearly there are lots of things that need to be done at many levels in universities in terms of representation, in terms of the curriculum. Um, 
But I think that the real challenge is the one that Coretta has put her finger on, which is that getting people to think intelligently and, and carefully and sensitively about that experiential side of this terrible structural issue. And, you know, we try to do it through unconscious bars training and so on, but it, it's these things can become quite formulaic and it's really thinking in an intellectual as well as a human way about that social reality that it's so easy for many of us to just forget about uh, that I think needs to move closer to the center of our practice. That's great, Nikki. Um, Tracy, maybe you can um, bring this home. We have, it looks like two and a half minutes to work with here. Okay, um, I have three short points on <laughs> the uh, translation of the movement to the academy and one point on the resonance of the of George Floyd's kill, killing and the relationship between that and the demonstrations and what we're seeing. The three quick points are something about, we have to think about what we actually teach and um, Nikki and Coretta and Tim have already spoken about that. The other two things I wanted to say is that the Academy also really needs to think seriously about what we research um, and how we go about that research. The, ways in which our research, especially those among us who do social science work, um, are we doing co um, community-based research practices and the like, and what efforts are we making to do that, to have our research actually dictated, especially on these questions, um, by the questions that the people who are most impacted by what we search actually care about. Um, and then the third thing is how we think about as academic researchers, how that work actually translates into practice. That's why in a lot of the work that Tom Tyler and I've done, we've talked a lot about the relationship between evidence informed practices and policy, but that evidence base of course is related to point two about what it is um, that we're actually researching. And I don't mean in saying that to make a call for all we need to be doing is RCTs and econometrics, and that's not what I'm talking about, right? Go back to the point about researching the questions that the people who are most impacted, both by the problems that the state uses to send uh, armed uh, responders and, and um, those problems and that impact. Those questions should be central. And the last point has to do with um, this moment, which again, I think is about the pandemic. And I think it goes back to something that Coretta said about whether we can be hopeful. If all this were about was about, you know, police reform and defunding or not, then I think I would be a little bit more pessimistic. Um, I actually think this moment is going to last for a, a few more weeks, several weeks, maybe in a, even a few months. But the one thing we do know is that COVID will be with us um, for a year or more. And the same people who are affected by the armed first responders who are out in the streets protesting are the same people who are impacted by the poor response, at least in the United States, um, to um, you know, addressing their needs in, in the pandemic. And so I think that's what's going to give us some traction for talking about how the state should respond with this set of critical public goods that I keep speaking about. Thank you. We're going to we're going to have to leave it there. Ladies and gentlemen, it's it's uh, folks, it's been a great pleasure to have the opportunity to to listen to our very distinguished uh, panelists today. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I can see that people have joined from all over. The list keeps growing. Somalia, Azerbaijan, where it's a huge platform. Tracy, Coretta, Nikki, and Tim, many thanks to, to all of you for taking time to share your thoughts about race and policing and more in the United States and beyond. I'm sure uh, our audience found them as helpful, constructive, and as hopeful as, as I did. To everyone from all of us at the U.S. Center at the LSE, stay healthy, stay safe, and take care.